Welcome everyone. I'm Natasha Marin, Marketing Campaign Manager at Terminal. And for those of you new to Terminal, Terminal is the world's first tech-enabled platform that identifies emerging tech hubs around the world and connects top engineers with world-changing companies. At Terminal, we hire, support, and retain elite global engineering talent so that fast-growing companies can focus on doing what they do best, building world-class products. This is the first of our three-part fireside chat series, State of Engineering, Growth During Economic Uncertainty, focusing on strategic areas that are top of mind for developer team and HR leaders. And today I have the great pleasure to introduce you to Terminal's co-founder and Chief Strategy Officer, Dylan Sirota, and Premise Data's Chief Operating and Chief Technology Officer, David Bischoff. And Dylan, I'll let you take it from here and dive into how to hit developer team growth goals on a budget. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And it is my pleasure to introduce David Bischoff. David is an industry veteran with over 20 years of experience leading teams, focusing on innovation, customer success, delivering great products. David, thank you so much for joining me. Excited to kick off this conversation. And maybe to begin with, um, if you could just share a little bit more about Premise. I know you guys are a late stage Series E company. You've raised money from some of the best investors, Westcap, Valor, uh, Social Capital. But we'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the business of Premise and your role there. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dylan. Excited to talk to you today. Um, Premise, as, as a company, we're, we're a global data collection and insights company at the end of the day. Uh, so we are operational in uh, 135 countries, and our goal is to really connect our customers with people that are on the ground in the countries of interest and, and really getting at the source, source of truth. So, you know, people that are living their lives day to day, they can help our customers get data as close to the actual source and in real time as possible. And that's really our goal. Uh, whether that that's, you know, prices at a, at a given re retail establishment or maybe where there's a pothole in the street uh, that, you know, rising gas prices. But, um, you know, we really want to understand how things are, are, are going um, at the at the ground level um, of data collection. And so one of the unique parts of premise is that all of that is paid for. So all of the data that's collected uh, you earn money. And so we're really able to not only impact our customers' data collection and insights, but really, um, you know, impact the lives of the people that are providing that data as well. Awesome. And your role, obviously, you're chief operating officer and you are acting CTO. Can you share a little bit more about what it looks like to be in that position today? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bit different. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we kind of realized a couple years ago is that it adds a lot of efficiency. Um, you know, I, I work with my global operations, customer operations and data solutions team, which is really all about collecting the data and understanding what it's saying. But then on the same end, I can work with my product and engineering team really, really closely and fill in the gaps and figure out what our roadmap is going to be to really understand where should we be investing? What are the things that are going to provide the most value? What are the things that are going to get us the best data, make our contributors' lives easier, and, and make the data collection more meaningful to everyone? So by kind of being able to do everything end to end, it, it really kind of fills in the gaps that you might see when, when the teams are separate. And I will say this is not going to be something that will forever be around. You know, it is, it is very finite in nature. You'll get to a point of growth in the company that having both roles is simply not possible. But in this kind of earlier stage of high growth where we're really figuring everything out, it's it's kind of been incredibly valuable for the company to be able to do both things. Awesome. I, I think it's it it's unique to have both positions, but the unique insight I think is uh, is very, very interesting. Um, thinking about the business just broadly, um, maybe just set the table. Can you share a little bit more about just the evolution of the company and the team? Um, you know, where have you built out? How large is the employee base? And then we'll dig into some more kind of structural questions around that. Yeah, we have 350 employees globally. Uh, we recently just finished an acquisition in Bogota. So we're really excited about that. Um, that, that grew our headcount uh, quite a bit as well. And, you know, from a, an office perspective, we're in San Francisco. We just recently opened a state of the art office in Washington, DC, an, an amazing kind of um, smaller but uh, pinnacle office in New York, and then we also have a, a an office in London. 
Um, our headquarters is in San Francisco. And, you know, over the years, we've really just been in, focused on learning what the signal and demand is in this sector and, and understanding where the gaps are in data and where people need the most help. Certainly, you know, we found that in, in countries that are still emerging, that is definitely a place where people cannot get a lot of data out of it. And so a lot of our growth and a lot of our focus has been there. But now that we've done that for a while, you know, I've been at the company for almost five years now. Um, we started with emerging, but now we're getting more into Europe, the United States, Canada, and, and countries that are, you know, more competitive in nature because there are existing data collection um, platforms out there. Um, but, you know, we've taken all the lessons learned and all of the um, scalability that we were able to do in the emerging countries. And we're simply now applying that to, to Europe and the U.S. And, and other countries like that. So it's been an amazing um, a ride along the way, I will say. Um, you know, when, when I started, we were probably in, in five or ten countries. And now being able to say we're in 135 and at the scale that we are at, um, you know, we have over 200,000 da uh, daily active users. Like it's it's massive, um, the, the growth that we've seen. Um, and so that's kind of been one of the rewarding things is that not only are we able to collect data at a global scale, but we're able to actually reward the people that are providing that data. That's awesome. And I'm uh, just super impressed with what you guys have built and the problems that you're solving and the scale that you're operating at. Um, so I'd love to understand, especially someone in your position sitting on the executive team overseeing a very complex but also very data driven business, looking at today's macroeconomic environment, how does the changes that we've seen over the last year, the concerns around inflation, the concerns around rising into interest rates as a late stage company, um, the way in which you're trying to grow while also balancing maybe more pressure from the external um, environment, both in terms of access to capital um, and maybe just more cautious expectations of growth. How does that trickle into maybe your thinking, the executive team? Um, have you had to make any stark changes in the way in which you approach operating and how you are guiding the business in a different way? If you could just share more of that with this audience, I think that'd be great. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it really kind of comes down to understanding your company's identity. Uh, you really need to know where your company is headed. And at the end of the day, you do have to make some tough decisions at times on what you're going to work on, whether or not you're going to keep hiring, whether or not you're going to slow that down or, or even pause it. And we've had to go through all of those things, as, as most companies over the last couple of years have had to. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to do what's best for the company um, and, and keep that in mind so that, you know, you're not kind of doing everyone a disservice. Um, so you have to be upfront. You have to be honest with your employees so they understand what's going on. Um, you know, we, we try to always cut spend first before touching our talent and affecting our teams. Uh, but at some point you may have to. And I think many companies have. And I think we've seen that in the news over the last six to eight months, a, a lot of cutting going on. Um, so, you know, you start with expenses and then contractors. And then, you know, the, for me, it's always, you, you know, your employees are the last on the list. Um, but that's that's kind of goal number one for me is try to rein in the budget, uh, understand we might need to pause things and, and, and where we need to be creative. So you need to be strategic about where we hire types of salaries. We're going to hire using stock options as incentivization and things of that nature. Um, you know, we, we have to be very cognizant that salaries can't keep climbing. Um, we're, we're a startup at the end of the day. And so you have to know when not to get into a salary war, right? Like you might have the, the ideal candidate, um, but they might have another offer from, you know, a, a, a fang company or, 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 you know, one of those billion dollar companies that you, you hate to go against. <laughs> and you don't want to get into that competition, right? You, you, you're never going to win. And so you have to avoid them and you have to find partners that can help you out in those situations, which is where Terminal has been so instrumental for us. Um, you know, you guys have kind of opened up new ways of hiring, new avenues to hire in. And, and that's been really monumental for us because not only has it allowed us to kind of expand where we hire and how we hire, but it's also really sped up the, the ability for us to hire. So, you know, it, it's very competitive right now. And, and it's also still a bit uncertain how things are going. 
So you just have to kind of be open-minded and, and realize that you need to think outside of the box. And when we found Terminal, we were super excited because it opened up that whole new network of employees that we could start trying to bring into our family. Um, and it's worked so well, right? I think, you know, you and I probably started talking around three months or, or, or so ago, and we already have five people hired through Terminal, which is absolutely fantastic. And, and the quality uh, of employees are is uh, just amazing. Um, you know, the, some of these folks have literally made an impact in our organization after two days of working at the company. It's been just wow. um, so uh, empowering to see that. And it's really changed the way that we can operate here. Well, I'm, I definitely appreciate the kind words. It's been great working with your team. And um, you've always had a very global mindset. You're a global business. And so I think you see the opportunity of building global teams and the advantages sometimes of going outside of the domestic market where we see such a shortage of developer talent. Meanwhile, even in the midst of layoffs, I think it was uh, last quarter, at least in Q2, even in the midst of layoffs, salaries for software developers were still climbing in the US. And I think you brought up a point of just being smart around where do you, uh, where do you wanna compete? And is it smart to compete in the red ocean going up against the FANG companies or do you find that blue ocean opportunity to expand? So maybe you could share a little bit more about that. Um, you know, how do you think about um, finding the best talent, but also competing with some of these large companies? Does it come down to the individual, your talent approach, and how you position the opportunity for for premise? Um, how do you stand out from that? Yeah, for for me, you know, you need to kind of have a, a balance. Um, I, I believe in kind of building a solid foundation. We're really big into getting into the office as well. So, you know, it's a combination of remotes and, and in-office in presence. And so we're really trying to cultivate a culture of ambition and innovation. And I, and I think that is a differentiating factor for us is that we really want to be seen as a company where you can come and make an impact. And I think that's where we can change how we're doing things versus how some of the bigger companies are doing things. Because when you go to a bigger company, it can be a little bit more cookie cutter and it can be a little bit more prescribed what you're going to be working on, how you're going to be working on it and things of that nature. But when you are working at a startup in a fast paced environment, you can really put your footprint on the company. And so, you know, we want people that are ambitious. We want people that are willing to participate. And, and I kind of go, I, you know, I, I, I preach this to, to my engineers and, and my teams in general, is that we want your input, right? We want you to have a say into what we're working on and how we're working on it. Bring a new code base into our, into our code base. Why not? Um, you know, bring a new technology, open up, you know, what we're thinking and, and think of things in new ways, challenge the status quo. You don't really get to do that as often as you probably like at a bigger company. And you can really do that at premise. And so I think, you know, you build that solid foundation, you surround yourselves with a few incredibly strong people uh, that can be in the office and can start building that culture and, and have that face to face time to to bounce ideas off of. And then you can start expanding more remote um, like we have with Terminal. And, you know, for me, it's about making sure that they feel like they're part of the company and not on an island in the middle of nowhere. I don't want people to feel like they're a contractor or they're just in a nine to five, five job with button seat, uh, writing code all day. Um, so, you know, for all of our remote folks, we're going to fly them in. You know, we want them to meet everyone face to face at least once a year, if not more. Um, so, so we want that, you know, interaction between people. And then we also want to give them a spotlight. So we do thing every two weeks at premise, we have all hands. And so we want, you know, everyone to do demos, right? We want to have at least, uh, you know, one to two demos, every all hands and invite people to talk about what they're working on. So you can put a face to the name and understand, oh, wow, that's something really cool. I'm going to reach out to this person and ask them about what, what they're working on, or I'm going to supply an idea to, idea to them of how they might want to consider uh, adding a feature or something along those lines. So we really try to encourage participation. And, and I think it really all starts with that ambition and innovation that they can drive and kind of create their own path at, at a startup company that you, you kind of get boxed in a little bit when you're at a bigger company. I'm, I'm sold. Uh, I want to apply. 
<laughs> no, I think what you've done as far as like the, the hybrid as well as expanding to remote, the emphasis on culture, um, all makes a lot of sense. And I think bringing back to just the topic of today of how do you think about being able to grow your team, your company with more constraints? You know, one of the things that, you know, I think is is sometimes lost in the overall calculus of um, of cost and budget is retention and culture very much tied to finding the right people, bring them into the organization and then keeping them because the cost of someone leaving is the cost of the vacancy of that product being developed and the, the, the lost productivity that you get to push new product into market. It is also the cost of rehiring, retraining. By most estimates, it's at least three to six months to ramp up a developer to be highly productive within, within a tech stack. How much do you, you know, I guess, think about the overall HR equation as far as growth of team, both in terms of growth, in terms of expansion with hiring, as well as monitoring employee satisfaction, employee retention? Yeah, so great question again. And I think you really need to understand um, what someone's motivation is at the end of the day. Um, some people are strictly financially motivated. Some people are career motivated. Some people are uh, creativity motivated. So you really need to kind of get in touch with your workforce and understand what, what, what's driving them. You know, is it flexible work schedule so that they can spend time with their family while also doing their job? Is it the salary? Is it, is it a combination of, of multiple things? And, and that is really the key to retention. It, it's not just about throwing money at people or making sure that you're giving them, you know, a, a 7% raise every year or something cookie cutter like that. Every single person has their own motivations and their own things driving them. And you really need to understand that and foster that. We have people that simply love the communities that they work in. So, you know, people that are big into the Android development and they want the opportunity to speak at conventions. We, we, we support that all day long. You know, definitely take take your time to, to make that happen. Uh, you know, put put a good name for premise out there in, in, into the convention. You know, we love that stuff. Um, and so that's a motivated, motivating factor for some people. Some people it is, I, I really believe in the, in, in the company, I'm, I want stock, right? You know, I, I'm all in, uh, but I'd, I'd like to be on this path, path with the company. So I'm, I'm stock motivated. So I think when it comes to retention, you don't want to just assume I'm just going to throw dollars at people. Um, it, and, and the other thing I would add is career progression making sure i think this is a stumbling block block premise had um early on in my career at the company is that we didn't have a good way for people to rise up the ladders and kind of spell that out and really understand the expectations for how that happens and how you move uh level to level so that's also been a key and it comes back to understanding that motivation and then having a good leveling guide and, and kind of explaining that to the employee and saying here's Here's kind of what we have. Here's all the different trajectories that you could be on. Where do you want to go? You know, are you interested in becoming a lead and then a manager and then, then a director? Do you want to become a principal engineer? Really understanding what people want to be uh, kind of when they grow up, as we say, uh, but also what are the other motivating factors on top of that? And when you think about motivation, but also the fact that <clears throat> your growth stage company going through this environment where I think the resounding sentiment is growth stage companies are in a challenging position. The public market is an open funding is in a, a challenging position. How do you think about from a leadership standpoint, building confidence to all the employees around the position, reinforcing the strategy? Um, because I've heard, you know, from folks across a lot of organizations, there's definitely a lot of kind of anxiety. Is my job going to be here? Is our company on the right path? Are we in a good strategic position? Um, and especially in a, in a large you know, private company, not everyone has kind of all the visibility around. So how have you thought about leadership in this time of uh, maybe employee uncertainty, anxiety? Yeah, I actually learned this pre, <laughs> pre pandemic and, and pre kind of economic scenario that we're all that, that we're all seeing right now which is you can't talk about vision and strategy enough. And, you know, I would talk about things probably in like the quarterly to um, bi-yearly cadence 
where I would I would go over vision and strategy and things of that nature. And then a couple months would go by and I would get a question and I would just think to myself, well, I thought I covered this. You know, I thought I covered this last time I talked. Am I not doing a good job communicating? Am I not doing enough to explain these things? And and honestly, what I found is that I wasn't doing it often enough. It's not that the messaging was wrong or that uh, it was conveyed incorrectly. It's that two to three months, if that time goes by and you haven't talked about vision and strategy, that's too long. And so what I've actually learned is that talking about those things on a monthly basis is probably about the right cadence that you need. And so, you know, when you have those all hands, when you have, um, you know, a monthly get together with your teams, you want to be talking about vision and strategy over and over and over again so that people don't lose that faith. Um, you know, they need to understand that the, the, the you know, the, the company knows what it's doing and, you know, those things can change, right? You can, you can, update them. You can adjust them. You, you don't necessarily want to completely rehaul it. And if you do, you need to openly talk about that and explain why. You don't want that to happen very often. But if someone is seeing a consistent message month to month to month, they're going to gain confidence that, okay, this company is on a trajectory. It has a strategy. It knows what it wants to do. It knows what it's going after. And they're going to just by that very nature, gain confidence in you and in the company and so that they won't be as scared as when we do have these situations, because they're going to know, OK, the company is just doing what's best to achieve that vision and strategy that it's been outlining month after month. So they're, they're going to stick with you a lot more often as long as you're constantly kind of conveying what you're trying to do. Uh, and, and that's what's really helped us is that, you know, that open communication and making sure that we're not letting um, people just assume that things are a certain way. I think it's such a, a good point and something that I feel like does take a long time to to realize, but just the clarity and consistency of, of message, be, it becomes familiar and familiar can help calm a lot of the kind of anxiety of, are we on the right path? Is, is it, you know, is, are we changing strategies every minute or do we feel like we've got leadership that is thinking about the long term and has the pathway to get there? So very much appreciate you opening up around that. Maybe going a little bit more tactically, global organization, lots of people. I know that communication is very big for you, transparency, um, meeting and building relationships across the team. How, as your company has gone into more countries, uh, you've, you've leaned into remote in certain ways, you've also established some of those in-office presences. How do you find yourself and how do you instruct leaders to maybe combine the different mediums of communication in person slack messaging more kind of thoughtful long form written communication how do you think that as a as a leader of maybe a a, a smaller um company should be kind of prepping themselves and their team for the right way as they branch out to be a global organization the right way they should think about communication broadly and maybe also learnings around time zone, culture, language, are those things that you think about and incorporate as well? Yeah, for sure. And, and time zones are very difficult. Um, you know, we, we have people that work from essentially Hawaii to Egypt. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, it's incredibly uh, difficult to, to get people working across all those di different time zones. Um, but, you know, you have to, you have to figure it out. And so, you know, we're, we're big slack addicts at premise. I will say um, that is definitely a nice real time, right? You need that real time level of communication. Um, and, and I will say it's something we're still working on. I, we, we certainly have not perfected it yet. And one of, one of the things that I, I do get a bit frustrated on is that we have too many meetings at our company. You know, there are, and, and that was the nature of going fully remote back in the early days of, of COVID is that I think, we were still trying to figure that out and, and we still have some bad habits from that time, which is too many meetings. And so it's, it's going back to figuring out what the right balance is between, you know, having a meeting versus just putting a Slack channel out there or just sending out an email. And, you know, one of the things that I, I like to really kind of talk to people out is don't be afraid to pick up the phone. I think like we've lost that, you know, People are so reliant on Slack or setting up a meeting uh, with having a big group of people. Um, 
that it, it's kind of like if you need something, th there's nothing wrong with just giving a phone call uh, and talking to the person every once in a while. I, how often does, th does that no longer happen where it could have just been solved if you had just, you know, put the, put the person on, uh, on your phone and, and had a quick five minute conversation with them? Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that I try and, and get people back in the habit. Let's, you know, let's try and eliminate some of these meetings and, and speak up, right? If you're on a meeting and it's a recurring meeting and you don't talk and you're not getting anything out of it, speak up, raise your hand and say, hey, you know, I, I think it's not worth it for me to attend this meeting anymore. Um, if, if you need me, let me know. But, for, you know, for going forward, I'm going to decline it. Um, but I'm here if you need me. And, and again, you know, not being afraid to just pick up the phone every once in a while and, and have that phone call. And then I, I will say, I, I absolutely love just getting people together. Um, just last week, I, you know, we, we flew in about 25 people into our DC office um, and we had what I call ops week. Um, so it's all the operations side of the house getting together. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, we were doing things like that. And this was the first one since, since everything lifted. Um, and we flew people in from around the world. It was, it was absolutely incredible. And I got to meet people that I hadn't met face to face and I had been working with them for over a year. I mean, just, just wow. think about how crazy that is working with people for 12, 18, 24 months, and you've never met them in person. Um, you should, you should try it. It's, it's yeah. amazing. And it really opens up doors and it really kind of builds that relationship and that rapport. And it builds a friendship that you just cannot get through Slack or through emails. Um, so I, I think for me, getting some face to face, not being afraid to pick up the phone, starting to eliminate some of the meetings that are probably a little a little extra than you need. Those are kind of the keys. And, and again, we're, we're by no means perfect yet. Um, it's a work in progress. But I, I think if we can really adopt those principles, we'll get there. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that and totally agree around the in-person. We're, I think, finally getting to that point as well as a globally distributed team. It becomes a little bit more challenging and complex to think about borders in, in new ways that maybe we didn't think about, um, you know, before uh, before the pandemic. But thinking about the fact that you've operated through the pandemic now this year with a lot of different things happening in the environment, is there any one thing that you've learned or, or that stuck out to you that um, you know, maybe you wish you had known before or guidance to leaders on this call who are operating today going through this that um, that you think maybe some folks either get wrong or, or that they should be aware of as they enter the next six to 12 months based on what you think is going to transpire within the economy and the effect it'll have on uh, startup and, and scale up technology companies. Yeah, for me, it, it really is a lot of different things. And I think the one takeaway that I would, you know, if I have to boil it into one thing, it's don't view this as, as throwaway, right? Take all of the things that we've learned over the last couple of years and, and, and apply it to the future as well. Don't think of this is all going to go away. You, you know, we, we need to take what we've done and adapt it into normal life. And so, you know, Things that we were doing three years ago, things that we'll be doing in three years. I think it's going to be some sort of a middle ground at the end of the day. It's going to be a, a, a cumulative effect of everything that's happened. And so, you know, I, I, I think, you know, things around budgeting and, and using your money wisely, like that should be things that we're always thinking about. That, that should be ingrained in us as part of our day to day processes. And when it comes to hiring, I think, you know, creating these mechanisms to, you know, engage people. I don't want to lose that. Right. I, I want to constantly be getting close to the workforce and I want to constantly be thinking about motivation and what drives people uh, constantly be, um, you know, avoiding battles with big companies that I know I can't win um, and, and being creative about how we're, we're going to hire. And then I, I will say, I will say I think one one thing that definitely has changed and, and will continue to be the norm is the length it takes to hire people. I think one of the things that We've learned, especially in, in these times, you can't have a, an interview process that lasts weeks or months. Um, you know, we used to, you know, we used to do take home tests. Right. And, and then you would set up an interview and then maybe the next week, another interview, maybe the next week, an interview after that. And so, you know, by the end of the time. 
this person's been strung out over weeks, if not months. They've had to do a take home test. They've they've kind of been uh, run through the ringer at, at the end. And you've just created this massive process that's incredibly elongated and it's not optimal in, in, in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, we've changed things. We got rid of the take home tests. We created a, a process where we have kind of a hiring manager interview, and then we have a three to four hour interview process, and then we're done. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've, we've shrunk this process down from potentially weeks or months to essentially two days. Um, and, and that, honestly speaking, everyone likes it, I mean, not just our employees, but the candidates as well, because they're going to get an answer within a couple of weeks of applying now assuming that they kind of made it through that initial hiring manager interview. We did the panel and then we have a panel review session. They're going to get an answer very, very quickly. And, and that is something that I think everyone can appreciate and something that I think has been an amazing change as we've, we've gone through this. And, it, and it's great for the company bottom line as well, right? Because now you're, you're optimizing everyone's time. Imagine someone that has to interview and, and they're one of your best engineers and they, they have to interview the next best engineer that you're hiring and you're taking up weeks, uh, you know, a week long process and, and all of these hours to help with the interviews and things like that, 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 you know, that takes away from their ability to kind of build. Right. And so I think the optimization of the hiring process and becoming more efficient is really something that everyone is going to take to heart and, and going to be part of, a, a, you know, a, a change that lasts in the, in the industry. I think that's such a good point and, and something that we see kind of across the board um, and something that still is surprising to me, just how companies preach that they want to move so quickly, that they want to hire the best talent. But then when you create a one month, two month interview cycle, you're forcing your team to move slowly. You're forcing decisions that are drawn out. Um, I think you bring up a good point, too, of the opportunity cost of that time and how do you evaluate that? And I think a lot of companies are maybe so scared of the false positive that someone might get through that isn't the right fit as if there's not kind of a way of identifying that performance and then managing it um, is, uh, is, uh, is, is very surprising to me. And I think you guys have been a leader on how can we actually make this as quick, as efficient and then still accurate um, as possible. And I think you're the, uh, definitely a leader in, the, in that respect. But for any company out there, if you can't get to the point where you are beginning an interview process and getting to a decision under 14 total days, I think that you're going to struggle to hire. And if you can't hire and you're extending then many more processes, the opportunity costs of both time and money, especially in today's world, I think is going to be um, a growing challenge. Well, transitioning towards the end of our conversation here before we open up some Q&A, um, please share with me what's what's most exciting for you, Premise, and the team uh, over the next year? Yeah, there, there's a lot. It's, it's always hard when I get asked this question because there's so, much, so many things that we're doing. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm incredibly excited about is that we're going to be launching a, a crypto wallet as part of our ecosystem. So inside the Premise app, we, we will have wow. a wallet to make cross-border payments and things like that easier. So that's incredibly exciting. And we think we're going to, you know, turn some things on their head, especially in the fintech space uh, by offering that because we will allow people to earn instead of having to tie a bank account in, they will just earn through doing tasks. And so they will have immediate availability of funds, which is a, a pretty big barrier to entry. I think on top of that is all the different data collection aspects that we're really spending time on investing in. So things about understanding uh, the mom and pop stores, uh, what we call a store census. But think about the bodegas of the world, the corner stores of the world, where they're smaller. You might have things on the floor, like, you know, just walls and walls of items. Taking advantage of the space that they have, uh, it's really easy to go into your supermarket and gather data. But think about a mom and pop or bodega store. So we're really kind of focusing on how we're going to optimize data collection in those scenarios. And then on top of that, you know, we're still going in big on understanding sentiment. So really kind of putting out surveys uh, across the globe and, and understanding how are people feeling about economic situations? How are they feeling about vaccines? How are they feeling about stability? So 
really kind of honing our abilities there. So you asked for one, I gave you three, I could, I could keep going, um, but I'll stop there for now. But I, I think, you know, the, the thing that always excites me about premise is that, you know, it's always a challenge. There, there's, there's always something going on. I, I never get bored at this company, which is what I, why I love it so much uh, because we're in so many countries working for so many different customers with so many different types of data sets whether I learn something about a country or a type of data or an industry we, we, we work with, I'm never bored and I'm not always learning something new. And that's what I appreciate most about this company. That's awesome. Well, David, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that. Thank you for joining me. Um, we've appreciated your partnership. We're excited to play a very small role in your journey to achieve your mission and all the great things um, you and the team are accomplishing. So with that, I will turn it back over to Natasha. We'll enter some Q&A. Um, so if anyone has questions, we're, we're excited to field them. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dylan and David, thank, uh, for attending the very first Fireside Chat today. And we have a couple of great questions that came in. And if anyone else has anything you'd like to ask, now is your chance. It's not too late, so feel free to type those in into the box. Our first question is from Daniel. Uh, do you guys find that having several recruitment partners is better or should companies limit themselves to partnering with just one? And Dylan, would you like to be the first one to take the tackle this one? Happy to, very curious to hear David's thoughts as well. So, you know, I think in today's world, especially when you think about if you are embarking on any sort of global hiring, um, I think that you have to be very thoughtful around the partner and, and what is the scope of their capabilities? What are they bringing to the table that is going to give you a strategic advantage? Because we are in a world of talent competition and you have to be sure that the partner you work with is bringing you into the right markets, has unique access to a talent pool, has something compelling that's going to capture the talent audience in a way that is going to fit the uh, the client and their needs. So I, I, I think that you should have a street, you should not be going down the path of spray and pray. So lighting up a bunch of contingent recruiters and just saying, whoever happens to find the one, you know, will pay you. I, I think that that doesn't build the right calibration for a, a company to understand what are you really looking for? How can we make your team successful? What are the right skill sets that we can help pre-identify and evaluate so we don't waste your time on the back end of the interview process. So I think it's a two-way street of nurturing your pipelines, not just opening as many pipelines as you can. However, I think we are in a day and age where specialization is also very critical. I think that having a partner that is very focused on the tech, building the technical side of the house and having the skills and expertise around recruitment in, in that domain, super helpful. I also think if you can find specialized on go-to-market, there are different ways that you can source, identify, attract, evaluate talent that is much more specialized in a different way than it is on the technical. So I think thinking about geography and then domain and functional area are kind of the ways that you can break it apart, but definitely not a fan of the kind of spray and pray method. David, curious your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, th I think you nailed it on the head. Um, you know, when I think about partners, I, I tend to think about what part of the business am I focusing on, right? Is it is it the engineering side? Is it the ops side? Is it finance? Is it customer success? Um, with each, you know, within each of those different expertises, you don't want more than one or two partners that you're working with, right? Um, ideally, you just have one because the specialization is, is quite important. Um, so, you don't want to go too big and you don't want to have so many, you know, so many cooks in the kitchen that you're essentially watering down the pool because, well, now you're just getting too many candidates in the pipeline and it's just kind of, you know, overflowing your inbox and you're overwhelmed and, and now you don't have a trusted partner. And, and so you're sinking and, and you don't know what to do. Um, so ideally within each of the kind of business sectors in your company, you have one, you know, one good partner that you're working with. And then maybe every once in a while, just to, you know, test the waters, you try out a second partner. Uh, I would limit it to that depending on the expertise you're going with. And I will say one of the interesting things that I've also found is that depending on where you're looking depend, you know, is also the skill set that you're going to get. So, you know, we found that, you know, one part of the world might have 
a high number of mobile engineers, but maybe not a high number of machine learning engineers. And another part of the world may be really good at machine learning engineering and, and not good with other aspects. So that's also kind of part of the, the ebb and flow of figuring out who your partners are going to be and why to partner with them. But you should be finding partners to fill a need and not just to provide volume. Awesome. Thank you. So our next question is from Aaron and Aaron wants to know, how do you identify the best global talent pool for your organization? Who'd like to take that one first? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm happy to go first. I think, well, partnership is huge, right? So, you know, Terminal does an amazing job of filtering us to like the, the top 10 candidates that, that we could possibly see for a position. And, and honestly, they make our job very difficult because the candidates that they give us are all really good. Um, and so, you know, that that is kind of first and foremost. And I, I will say that the part that matters probably most to me is the cultural fit. I think you can teach people technology. You can pe teach people um, coding skills and, and things of that nature. But it's very difficult to, you know, teach culture um, in terms of, can you find that they are immediately not a good fit? Are they, you know, do, do you want someone in this role that's extroverted and they're incredibly introverted or, or, or things along that, that line? So, you know, when you're talking to, um, you know, anyone uh, anywhere in the world, I think you really have to focus in on culture just as much as you are with the skill sets that they're bringing to the table. Because what I've definitely seen and found in my career is that if you find one bad apple, they could be the most gifted engineer or the most gifted um, salesperson in the world. If they destroy your culture and one person can destroy your culture, then it was all for, for nothing at the end of the day. So for me, you know, no matter where you're looking, you need to prioritize culture just as much as you are skill set. I think that's great. And, and adding on to that, I think it's the, there's a lot of I don't think there's a silver bullet, but there's questions you need to ask yourself as an organization. Um, you know, first and foremost, what are we optimizing for? Is it just the best talent regardless of location? Is it the best talent within certain time zones that we feel comfortable operating in? Are we looking for contract talent or full time? That leads you down the pathway of understanding is the market, is there socioeconomic stability in the market? Are there labor laws that make sense for full time hiring? Going into a market, what's the competition level for different skill sets? Is there an advantage relative to the alternatives? Is it affordable knowing that there's going to be maybe some incremental cost around the fact that they're not very local to a, a certain location? So I think first asking, you know, what is going to best serve our needs and then being able to map that out to the various talent pools and then being um, diligent around, you know, sticking to uh, those different preference points as you look to expand. And so we've got a framework of about 70 data points that we track by different talent pools so that if someone is op optimizing for cost above all else or speed to hire or specific talent um, skill set or time zone, that you can actually think about a framework and, and there are talent pools that are better for certain reasons and there are other town pools that are better for other reasons. Yeah, I'll just add on to that real quick. You have to have a plan in place also for the time zones. Uh, you know, you, you need to understand how you're going. If you if you have if this is the first foray into, you know, dealing with someone that's six hours different in time zone, go into it with a plan on how you're going to deal with that, whether or not that be a kind of, you know, chat software so that people can be in real time. What's the meeting? How are you going to train them? Uh, you, you don't want to go into it cold turkey. You want to understand, OK, I'm hiring someone that is six hours different than, than every single other person on this team. Um, what am I going to do? And, and how am I going to make them? Again, I, I said this earlier, you do not want people to feel like they're on an island. You want them to feel like they are an integrated part of your team. So going into that a little bit ahead of time with a plan in place for how you're going to integrate that person into your workflow will, will be key. Excellent. I think those are great questions. So thank you. And I think that wraps up all the questions we have today. Dylan, David, thank you again so much for taking the time and giving us your insight. I know I learned a lot, so I appreciate it. And be sure to join us for the next fire.
fireside chat next month on October 26th. We have some awesome speakers lined up from Terminal, Credit Karma, and Babbel. So be sure to register to get those dates saved on your calendar. Thank you.